So today we are doing Corruptible by Brian, I'm going to say class, could be, would you, is that how you pronounce it? I would, I would I, say it like that, yeah, yeah. Class. Okay, cool. Uh, who's a political scientist, am I right to think Yes. This? I'm going to quickly, yeah. He goes and I to, think he's a university yeah. professor, isn't he? Yeah. Hold on a second. It is Brian, yeah, he is a comparative politics at the London School of Economics. And oh, I thought, he was, he, I thought he used to be at LSE. Yeah, he's an, now, prof- he's an associate professor. He's an associate professor in global politics at University College London at the moment. Yeah. Okay, cool. yeah, so yes, he is writing all about power and the use and misuse, and uh, sort of the theory behind who gets power. And I just want to stop. It's a good book, man, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I enjoyed we've seen it. this. We've seen this off the podcast. It's one of those books which which I like personally, and obviously you like too. Which is like take the common consensus on things and then kind of like debunk why it's not just that or debunk it to the point where it's like oh it makes you think of other factors of why things occur right yeah. it's dissecting what we we take for granted as knowledge and then allowing us to consider alternative explanations for the same thing which i really really enjoyed um, i think that's key yeah i think when it comes to corruption we can just have some kind of default way that we look at things and attribute oh that must be corrupt or this must be corrupt without having a kind of complex understanding of the actual Mm. concept in itself and so there were a bunch of things reading this book where i was like oh that's a really interesting way to look at it or like oh we should definitely take that into consideration when we're talking about corruption Um, more nuance right it's just it's it's not so one-dimensional it's three-dimensional four-dimensional whatever you want to Mm. say it's got multiple you know factors um, as we'll get into. So yeah, part one was the introduction and it started with this book answers four main questions. So these are, first, do worse people get power? Second, does power make people worse? Third, why do we let people control us who clearly have no business being in control? And then fourth, how can we ensure that incorruptible people get into power and wield it justly? Um, I quite liked how it started off with this as well. Just like yeah. this is what we're going to this is what we're going to tell you in this book, or these are the questions we're going to try and answer. Because um, funny enough, you know, the, the how to read a book was almost it almost encouraged you to come up with the questions yourself before you read yeah. the book. Like, what am I actually going to learn here? But this guy just gives it to you. Like, this is what we're going to try and address. Yeah, I guess it's his versions of the questions. Because then you could you could read a book with your own kind of agenda to read it mm. and create your own questions that are more personable to you. But yeah, in this. He laid it out pretty well, and to be fair, I quite liked it. I like it at the end of a, I like it at the end of a chapter where the last like sentence is like almost hinting at the next chapter. Yeah, and it's like, but we need to know this. Oh, bam! Yeah, and here's the next yeah. chapter. You know, um, which he did quite a lot. I kind of. It's like the equivalent of like a, a TV series cliffhanger ending kind yes, of type yeah, thing. Yeah, kind of is. More. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, all right. Well, do you want to re- read the first bit? Yeah. So is conventional wisdom about power wrong? So perhaps the conventional wisdom is right. Power does corrupt. But sometimes, though, the conventional wisdom has got it wrong. What if power doesn't make us better or worse? What if power just attracts certain kinds of people and those people are precisely the ones who shouldn't be in charge? Maybe those who want power are least suited to hold it. Perhaps those who crave power are corruptible. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to read the next bit as well? Uh, Yeah, go ahead. See, this, this bit was really interesting because I feel like we've all, well, me and you've come across this sort of experiment of multiple times across many books, but the Stanford Prison Experiment. So the Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted in the summer of 1971. Volunteers selected to be guards were given uniforms in a prison specifically to de-individuate them and instruct to prevent prisoners from escaping. Their exper- experiment officially started when the prisoners were arrested by real police. Over the following five days, psychological abuse of the prisoners by the guards became increasingly brutal, um, which I thought was super interesting. So the, the context is random people have been chosen or become prison guards and they become more controlling, more abusive towards the prisoners as their role sort of, as the role went on. Yeah. Um, so a simplified conclusion was made from this study, power corrupts. But there was a catch. The seemingly straightforward narrative of the Stanford Prison Experiment which had become conventional wisdom in psychology, wasn't so clear-cut. Only some of the guards were abusive. Several resisted 
and treated the student prisoners with respect. So even if power does corrupt, there are some people more immune than others. So the picture is a bit murky than we are led to believe, but even with those caveats, the experiment is harrowing. Ordinary, ordinary people, if put in the right conditions, can become cruel and depraved. So are we all just sadists waiting to be amassed once we, uh, once we get control over others? The answer, thankfully, is probably not. Zimbardo's conclusion didn't take into account a crucial aspect of the study, which is how the participants were recruited. And this is it's, it's what we're talking about, the psychology of totalitarianism yeah. and everything about like how these studies are done influences everything, right? It influences mm -hmm. the results. So, Absolutely. So how the participants were recruited. The, to find prisoners and guards, researchers placed this ad in the local newspaper. Male college students needed for a psychological study of prison life. $15 per day for one to two weeks beginning August 14th. For $15 a day. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. quite funny, isn't yeah. it? Oh, that's probably information. Uh, information. Yes. Inflation. Inflation. Like, back then, that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back then, that was probably a decent a wage, you know? Because what was yeah. this, 1971? Yeah. Yes, no, of um, course. So, yeah, for further information and applications, contact. So in 2007, researchers at Western Kentucky University noticed a small, seemingly insignificant detail about that ad. It made them wonder whether it had inadvertently skewed the study. To find out, they replicated the ad, only changing $15 to $70. Ah, to adjust for inflation, there you go. Yeah. So it should be $70. Every other word in the updated ad was identical. Then they created a new ad. It was the same in every way with one key difference. It replaced the line for a psychological study of prison life with the phrase for a psychological study. In some college towns, they placed the prison life advertisement. In, other, in others, they placed a psychological study ad. The idea was to have one group that volunteered for a prison experiment and another that volunteered for a generic psychology, psychology study. Would there be any difference between the people who responded? Once the recruitment period closed, the researchers invited the prospective participants in for psychological screening and a thorough personality evaluation. What they found was extraordinary. Those who responded to the prison experiment, uh, yeah, experiment av advertisement, sorry, scored significantly higher measures of aggressiveness, authoritarianism, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and social dominance, and significantly lower on dispositional empathy and altruism compared to the generic study. Just by including the word prison in the advertisement, they ended up with a disproportionately sadistic batch of students. It's so um, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It, 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 that also kind of makes some form of logical sense that if you it see does. the word prison, some people are more inclined to be interested in it than others. Um, there was one thing that I was going to pick apart there, though, is that they did say in some college towns, they place the prison life advertisement and in others, they place the psychological study. So you could argue that there's yep. also a different demographical cohort of people at different in each universities town. right like, different, different towns yeah for sure yeah harvard is going to be di very different to a non you know um yeah i was going to say russell group a uc um, like you, either take your sample from yeah, jehovah's college. witnesses or something or people who've like yeah you know, yeah because religious who are less likely to behave in certain ways would well, actually yeah, exactly. bias the sample you know it's and think about right, like don't know the demographic think about like the kind of american college um uh culture surrounding you know um uh sororities and like frat houses and the kind of like is it phasing is that what they call it yeah it is phasing yeah with it is like, phasing, uh, initiation yeah. right yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so you could imagine that those people are also probably people who are more inclined to to do these kind of things and some universities are stronger in that kind of culture than others but no definitely like this is really interesting just how like removing that one word um yeah instantly so, yes. attracts different people yeah, yeah yeah so what does this all mean that finding could invert the conclusions of the Stanford prison experiment in ways that fundamentally transform our understanding of power. Instead of demonstrating that ordinary people thrust into power can become sadistic, it may demonstrate that sadistic people seek out power. Maybe we've had it backward. Maybe power is just a magnet for bad people rather than a force that turns good people into bad. In that formulation, power doesn't corrupt. It attracts. Um, and yeah. yeah. I mean, he's I not saying this a... obviously definitively here. He's just saying, what if, you know, it's, it's like a... If this is the case, then maybe it isn't the way we thought it was, uh, yeah. which is that power corrupts. And this is what we mean when we were saying at the beginning of the book, this is what we like. It's like, okay, we take what people currently believe and go like, actually, we've been informed by experiment, which can be proven to be slightly erroneous, I guess you could say, or erroneous. And therefore, we could be pulling exactly the opposite conclusion from the same experiment. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I thought it was a really good example to let like start the book off because it's like, yeah. well, is it the system? Is it the individual? Do we differ mm -hmm. as individuals? Um, yeah. So the four elements of corruption, 
there are a series of possible solutions to exasperately uh, exasperatingly to the exasperatingly yeah yeah Jesus, um, complex problem. puzzle of corruption and power. First, power makes people worse. Power, um, power corrupts. You're running a business empire, and before you know it, you're rigging elections and buying <laughs> airplanes with money that isn't yours. Second, it's not that power corrupts, but rather that worse people are drawn to power. Power attracts the corruptible. The psychopathic pharmacists can't resist climbing a doomed ship's hierarchy, and the sadists can't resist the allure of slipping on a uniform and beating a prisoner with a baton. Third, the problem doesn't lie with the power um, with the power holders or power seekers. It's that we are attracted to bad leaders for bad reasons, and so we tend to give them power. Our captains and not just imaginary ships are selected for irrational reasons. When they crash us into rocky reefs, we have only ourselves to blame. And fourth, focusing on the individuals in power is a mistake because it all depends on the system. Bad systems sp um, spit out bad leaders. Create the right context and power can purify instead of corrupt. A corrupt system attracted, um, system attracted corrupt students and an honest system attracted honest students. Perhaps it's not about power changing people, but rather about the setting. Yeah. I mean, there you go. Four different lenses to view yeah. the same result, I guess you could say. Um, yeah. And once again, I feel like even after reading this book, he's, he's, there's no kind of like um, distinct conclusion of what it really is. It's kind of like a mix yeah. of the four, you know, it's just like you can view it for all these different lens. And there's, I feel like every situation is going to have a melange of the like different ones, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's a different configuration every time almost. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah. But it's still like saying, you know, these are the four factors and we need to take yeah. that into consideration. Yeah. Like almost yeah, the, the, the elements, the principles, whatever you want to call it. So cool so now moving on to part two the evolution of power so before diving into questions of who seek power who gets it and whether it changes us we should zoom out there's a more fundamental question why do we as humans set up our societies in a way that inevitably makes a small group of people powerful and a large group of people powerless so studying chimpanzees the similarities present uh these similarities present a seductively simple hypothesis if you want to understand how humans relate to power, status, and hierarchy, maybe you can just look at chimpanzees. If they're our closest animal relative, perhaps we can understand ourselves by understanding them. Decades ago, Dutch primatologist named Franz de Waal noticed that the social structures of chimpanzees were far more complicated than was previously known. To be in charge, a chimpanzee certainly needed to be large and physically strong, but it wasn't guaranteed that the biggest chimp would always become the most powerful chimp. Instead, Aspiring leaders had to build alliances, curry favour with kingmakers, and distribute resources. Those who did not climb their way into the alpha male position had no job security. Usurpers were always waiting for a moment of weakness so they could form their own coalitions and topple him. But as much as power influences the behaviour of chimpanzees, it isn't their sole consideration. Just like some humans, some chimps are irresistibly drawn towards power. Others try their hand at dominance, but don't mind ending up as followers. Um, it's funny that, like, I was just yeah. from you reading that uh, because I'm con uh, currently reading Anti Fragile. Yeah. It is like an anti fragile system, as in, like, nature has designed this system where people are constantly challenging the leader to basically, you know, their stresses at the end of the day to build or to get like a leader that is strong enough to kind of yeah. lead people. It's just quite interesting that, um, yeah, from the back of reading that. No, I get what you're saying, like, you because, uh, you're trying to like give the stresses to the leader so they can change the direction maybe or whatever mm. of the group right yeah because if you just let the leader run riot and just do whatever they want eventually is obviously going to in some form lead to some level of like lack of collective interest right because the individual is going to take decisions based on what they want so by giving yeah. this feedback and stuff yeah but also they can become like <clears throat> incredibly laissez-faire right because mm -hmm. if they if no one's ever going to challenge them then they're just always in control and never actually do anything because they don't have to worry about anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, on to the next part. So how humans differ, f um, blah, blah, blah. how humans differ form is chap. Is that right? Am I reading? I, right? no, 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 I think, I think it's, there's a mistake there. I think it's meant to be from. From chimpanzees, say. a fairness study with yeah. children. Sorry. Let me do that again. How humans differ from chimpanzees, a fairness study with children. The study had three versions. 
In the first, the children would walk into a room and the lucky child would find three rewards waiting for him, while the unlucky child would find one. In the second, both children would pull a rope. The lucky kid would again, uh, would again get three rewards, compared to one for the unlucky kid. In the third setup, the children would work together equally on a task, and at the end, there would still be a three-to-one split. The idea was to see whether our instinct was towards sharing, and crucially, whether it mattered how the rewards were allocated. In the first version of the study, none of the children shared. In the second, some did. But the third version, in which equal collaborative effort led to an unequal outcome, produced the most intriguing result. None of the two-year-olds shared. But an astonishing 80% of the lucky three-year-olds gave up one of their rewards to be on equal footing with their unlucky companion. Their instinct was towards fairness, particularly after cooperating. More plausibly, the act of collaboration engendered a sense of we that led children to see their partner as equally deserving of the spoils. Tomasello and his co-authors began to wonder whether such an instinct a uh, cooperation instinct had somehow evolved in humans. But was it uniquely human? Tomasello decided to conduct a similar study with chimpanzees. When the experiments were run, sharing was rare. Crucially, the setup didn't change the outcome at all. Collaboration was irrelevant. There was no sense of we and no sense of fairness. For chimpanzees, dominance doesn't come with second thoughts. And I think that's pretty fascinating because it kind of just shows you where we start to differ as human beings, doesn't it? As yeah. Like, along that kind of evolutionary route, um, how we... Yeah, and just having an instinct for sharing based on collaborative effort, like mm. in terms of we have a sense of almost justice relating to co like cooperation, right? Like whenever we cooperate, we feel like because we've both, or whoever you cooperate, have, cooperate with, have put effort into the result, the results or the spoils should be shared to some yeah. degree. It's not saying it's egalitarian, like egalitarian, like so they will give 50-50, but it's just saying they're more likely to give some of the spoils away if you collaborate. And it kind of makes sense. If you can just do like a thought experiment, like you and your buddy go go do something together and you one of you gets paid or something, you, you'd want to share it more than you both do the lottery and one of you wins it Yeah, yeah. to some degree. Yeah. Or like some sort of like gambling thing or whatever, yeah. Hmm. So I wonder if there's sense. also like an element where just be, like we're able to perceive the future and that mm -hmm. we will require that person's like help again. Yeah. And although they didn't like contribute like 50% in this regard, that we still need them later on. And so it's worth us like, sacrificing a bit now for the future. Um, yeah, no, I'm sure that plays into a little part of it for sure. You know, I think that was one of like Matt, wasn't that like one of Matt Ridley's like arguments in the, um, the evolution of corporation, I think it was, wasn't it? Like Maybe. the idea of like, um, like, yeah, like you said, knowing that you're going to have to collaborate again in the future. So having an instinct to share the spoils makes sense. Especially well, think... if you were like evolved to be in a small society where you're obviously just going to see each other all the time. Yeah. And I think that kind of touches on, you know, one of the fundamental aspects that makes us human and makes us different mm. is that we can perceive the future. And it's almost like, you know, we're plagued by the idea that we can, you know, know the consequences of our actions to an extent, um, whereas animals can't. And so... Yeah they act in the now, in which case they wouldn't need that. They don't care that much about fairness because they can't perceive them, can't perceive it as much later on. Um, yeah, okay, they can't, yeah, okay. The consequences that is or the point. ramifications of it. Yeah. It would make also sense why that was, like, that instinct has become something we act on as well. Mm. In comparison, like, if you can't see the potential benefit, they don't act on it emotionally or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that was an interesting point here about obviously the the evolution of cooperation. Now we're going to start looking into sort of more the aggress the aggressive side. So our primate legacy. The evolutionary psychologist Mark Van Vut, I don't even know, Voot. Pretty sure that's Voot, Voot, know. explains it would be very strange if even in these hunter gatherer societies that there wouldn't be people who tried to dominate others because that's basically part of our primate legacy. So the changing logic of violence, the the development of ranged weapons changed what the fittest meant when it came to survival of the fittest. Si size was no longer as important. Evolutionary biologists have argued that this shift is a key reason why the physical size differences between males and females are, na are narrower in humans than in any other great ape species. If the scientists are correct, then part of the reason why men are usually inches rather than several feet taller than women is, is because of how our shoulders are designed. But the biggest change that came from ranged weapons uh, and the great leveling they made possible 
was the flattening of hierarchies from chimpanzee de despotism to hunter-gatherer cooperation, which is another good point, which, uh, which we weren't thinking about. Then obviously cooperation, the instinct for cooperation is there, but also the, the logic change of violence, which is now like, um, you know, they want to piss people off because they yeah. throw, throw a, a spear at you, whatever. Yeah. Um, I've never so heard yeah. that point before where like, you know, the um, sexual dimorphism, you know, the, the reason why we're like men are bigger than women has shrunk due to not being as in as much of a dominance hierarchy based on just Yeah, but not size. needing the size. Yeah, yeah not needing exactly. the size to be like the alpha male is less like in pretty much all the other like species, right? It's based usually upon size and strength yeah. to some degree, not all, but to some degree. Yeah. And then obviously you think of this, like, like you're saying here, once that, once the ability to forge distance weapons became available to humans, the, the size didn't matter. So therefore sexual selection would have probably gone to the people who could use these weapons the best or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a good so point. yeah. Um, all right. So reverse dominance hierarchy. Chris Bohm, an anthropologist at the University of Southern California, developed a broadly accepted explanation for the subsequent flattening of hierarchies in human society. He coined the somewhat clunky term reverse dominance hierarchy for the phenomenon, but the idea is similar. But the idea is simple. A dominance hierarchy is a steep triangle, with the head honcho towering over everyone else from the apex. A reverse dominance hierarchy is a flat line, where everyone is more or less equal, at least formally. Boehm explains that anyone who tried to change the flat line back into a steep triangle did so at his or her own peril. As one anthropologist put it, all men seek to rule, but if they cannot rule, they prefer to be equal. Our instinct to rule was superseded by a stronger desire to not be ruled by someone else. Which is a really interesting point. So, instead of accepting that primate-style arrangement, many early humans designed a different way of life, in which nobody could be in charge. Any individual who tried to seize power, um, what Boehm calls an upstart, would get dominated by the group, torn back down to the same level as everyone else. The upstart could face expulsion, harassment, or even death. I wonder if this is where that sort of like super um, aggressive, like troll internet behavior comes from. Because a lot of it comes from like envy and trying to bring people down, you know? And I wonder if that's that yeah. like instinct channeled through the social media they're like this person thinks he's better than me he's posting online i'm gonna shout loads of hate at him and bring him down to my level you know kind of thing yeah it's, it's not like it's not overtly saying i'm more dominant than you but by having the like by doing something like that you're kind of almost suggesting that you are because you're you're putting yourself out there in the media or whatever you know yes um, well i wonder like it probably fluctuates along the spectrum right you probably have some trolls who are really insecure and so want to bring people down to their level but then there are mm -hmm. some people who are boasting a lot and need to be brought down right yeah yeah and so it's just like finding that kind of optimal point at which you'll bring everyone down to the same kind of point um yeah interesting i saw an example it's really annoying i saw an example of this the other day and i just can't okay. remember it but i remember like thinking about this point i was like oh that's why they're doing that um what was it on social social media was it on like in like real life you saw something I think it was like a documentary or something it might have okay. been a bit in like maybe it was the the David Beckham uh, documentary. The idea that okay, like, yeah. um, Alex Ferguson, you know, would just be like, "I don't care if you scored the fucking winning goal, we're getting back on." Right? There's yeah, not yeah. going to be a leader here. We're all a team. There's not like one person yeah. that's leading it. Instead, it's like you know, fuck it. Okay, done. We're moving on now. Um, and yeah, wouldn't yeah. acknowledge. And then he would also not acknowledge the bad stuff either, which I thought was yeah. quite good. Um, you're not like trying to lift someone up. You're just trying to like it doesn't matter it's yeah you know, yeah it, keep it's, the level heads like yeah nothing is good or bad but thinking makes it so that kind of like old saying okay yeah um, yeah 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 i do yeah i guess i don't know if the parallel with um with the trolls actually makes sense now that i think about it more but like i feel like yeah there is this instinct in all of us for sure or at least i don't know i see it myself sometimes that is like rejects the idea of being dominated in any mm. form and when I say domination, I don't mean like physically, but I mean like also mentally. And like, it's like when people get told what to say, you know, this mm. is kind of what there's like the anti woke movement as well. It's because people just like hate being told yeah. that what they like, that first of all, that they're like below other people, but also they hate being like controlled in that way. Yeah. Um, More so than like leading. I thought yeah. that was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah.
So yeah, the return of power and hierarchy. So between 11,000 and 5,000 years ago, everything changed. Clans were mostly replaced by tribes, char- uh, tribes, chiefdoms, and archaic versions of states. Hierarchical societies that did, ex- uh, that did exist got more hierarchical. Our world was no longer flat. Power returned with vengeance. What had happened? So the changing logic of war. As ranged weapons became more common, the dynamics of warfare started to dramatically favour societies with more soldiers. If a few hundred people got together and formed an army under the rule of a single chief, egalitarian bands of 20 to 80 members just couldn't compete. And when humans get together in large groups or larger groups, flat societies become impossible. Put enough people together and hierarchy and dominance always emerge. It's an ironclad rule of history. Some people had to learn this the hard way. Bands that stubbornly stuck to old ways of, the, old ways of flat society started to get wiped out by those who joined together and embraced chiefs. Plus, on the battlefield itself, having leaders, brackets generals, with formal power over their soldiers was more effective than a ragtag bunch of soldiers making their incisions. Take this following example. So you have two armies, one with 500 archers, the other one with 1,000 archers, at least the arrows at once. For simplicity's, for simplicity, sorry, let's say that 30% of the archers hit their target. 300 archers from the smaller army are wounded or killed, 30% of 1,000 arrows, fires equals 300, but only 150 archers from the larger army are hit, so for 30% of 500. After one exchange of fire, it's now a battle of 850 versus 200. The 2 to 1 advantage is quickly shifted to a more than 4 to 1 advantage. After one more volley, everyone in the small army will be wounded or killed. The bigger army will still have 790 archers left. Battlefields don't always follow the logic of math on blackboards. Tactics, terrain, and the element of surprise, as well as quality of weapons and soldiers, are all incredibly important variables. But the key point is this. Mathematical logic shows that the advantage of having larger army is much greater for armies using ranged weapons than those engaged in close combat. Those battlefields dynamics didn't stay on the battlefield. Once people become a general, they tend to get a taste for power. The people that were put in charge of the military uh, leaders gradually usurp more power for themselves and set themselves up up as chiefs, Peter Turchin says in his book Ultra Society. Bands became tribes and tribes became chiefdoms. But if Turchin is right that warfare triggered this social shift, why didn't it happen sooner? Why was there a sudden rise in hierarchy in a narrow band of human history? The answer lies not with weapons, but with food. So yeah, I I do quite like this chapter, do you remember? Mm. Because obviously this was like without going into like the rest of the points that we discussed at the very beginning of the book, like the four elements of like power and corruption yeah. or whatever. He's kind of trying to give this whole backstory of how we've even got to this point where we have a necessary need for hierarchies and power and control, etc. And these are all, you know, explanations that make sense. Obviously, they're almost impossible to verify. Yeah. In the sense of like everything happened <laughs> in the past and like well, this is complete. Uh, what's the word? Like hypothecation, I guess. But it does make sense when you think about it that this would be at least a factor in why some of this, these shifts might happen. Because he makes yeah. a good point. At the end of the day, when humans disagree and they can't find rules to agree on, the last thing they end up doing, which as we've seen throughout history, is war slash violence. And therefore, if, the, if violence is won or lost via you know, sheer numbers, it makes sense how we've now ended up with this state of like, the world where we have all these different countries or nation states. You yeah. know? It yeah. almost, it, like, this is like, not the end game, but it's, it just shows the progression over the time. Um, yeah, how we've co- co- kind of banded into bigger, bigger groups, you know. And I, I also think that it's almost like not a conscious decision. I think it is a natural kind of progression. Just as like, you know, when a fundamental tool is created, that you then can't mm-hmm. change society. You can't imagine what life would be like without the internet, right? Um, yeah. It's just so fundamental, and it's almost like that as well with having larger and larger bands, is because I think. You know, it's it when you're when you're a small tribe, then it makes sense that you have this kind of egalitarian kind of view to everything where there's no hierarchy and everyone kind of does a bit of everything. But yeah. with that, it's kind of slow progress and slow development. Whereas as soon as you start to have more people, then there's no point in everyone doing the same thing. And so you would start to have like specializing and then that starts to create the hierarchies. But as a consequence yeah. of that, you have better development like you know a faster progress of society and you wouldn't go back it wouldn't make any sense to go back but also i'm not sure whether there was like a point where it's like oh we've got one too many people now and now we're you know now we're having hierarchies i think it just came naturally and you couldn't foresee going back because it wouldn't make sense um yeah 
Yeah. No, for sure. Like the, the, the benefits you get as well from having like, I think, I think we go into this in a minute through the ag- ag- agricultural shifts and stuff and the benefits, but it is like once the, the momentum has shifted and obviously we're setting up these more, like, like you said, specialized roles within society, et cetera, we're creating more goods, et cetera, whatever. It, it becomes hard to not want to be part of all fact. It becomes almost mm. nigh impossible to not be part of these societies. Yeah. Um, because you don't have the availability of the technologies these societies or groups of people have created, you know? So it's, um, and I wonder if there's also an element of it that is also like ties in like Maslow's hierarchy, right? As you start to have more and more people and more of your needs are met because more people can do things. Mm -hmm. There is now an opportunity for you to, um, indulge in something that you're good at or that you're better than other people at, right? And that kind of gives you a bit of like self-worth. Like obviously we're talking about, you know, hunter-gatherer societies here. So (laughs) I don't know how advanced their, you know, hierarchy has become. But my point being is in, I wonder if that also lends into it. It's like, no, I want to go and fish because I'm really good at fishing. There's no point you coming down to do it because you're shit. Like, yeah, yeah. um, I mean, that's the very beginning of economic specialization and division of labor. That's, Mm. um, Funny yeah. enough, actually, that links right into the principles of economics I just finished reading recently. He talks a lot mm. about how, like, it just makes sense as well that people, if they're good at stuff, just stick with it. Because why would, if you're, if I'm catching 10 fish an hour and you're catching one, it just makes sense productivity wise for yeah. me to be the one doing the fishing and you find something else to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, the, the bigger the society gets, the more cooperation that's possible and therefore the more stuff that can be done to aid the group, so to speak, or whatever. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so on to agricultural shifts. The traditional explanation for that abrupt shift popularized by Jared Diamond in Guns, Germs and Steel goes like this. Agriculture made it easier to have excess food. Once there was, a, uh, once there was more food to go around, some people hoarded it. Those surpluses made inequ- inequality possible. They also made it possible to support a larger group of people because growing peas was scalable in a way that hunting gazelles wasn't. As surpluses and population sizes grew, societies became both more complex and more hierarchical. And with surpluses and hierarchy came more conflict as individuals and groups fought to establish their primacy in a rapidly changing system. Robert Camero, writing in 1970, developed a theory called environmental circumscription. The idea is elegant. He argues that the rise of agriculture put a premium on controlling land in a way that was um, simply absent for hunter-gatherers. What's the point of controlling a patch of dirt if the gazelles you're hunting are just going to move somewhere else? With farming, your survival was linked to the soil you occupied. More soil meant more um, productive capacity. Controlling land became much more important. So was it war or food? So which theory is correct? Was it war or was the rise of, was it the rise of agriculture? Our world is too complex for one unifying theory that explains everything. Most scholars, however, agree that both warfare and agriculture, war and peace, if you will, played a significant role in generating large, complex hierarchical societies. The benefits yeah. of hierarchy. Um, the obvious conclusion is that hierarchy and power are neither good nor bad. They provide a tool. A tool a tool that can be used to facilitate cooperation and community or to exploit people and kill them. Turchin agrees. Hierarchy is like fire. It can be used to cook food or to burn people. But without (laughs) it, all of the marvels of civilization would be impossible. We are not ants, Turchin explains. We don't have uh, pheromone systems. So hierarchy is the only way that humans can cooperate and coordinate in large-scale societies. Plus, because hierarchy can breed competition, it can also spark innovation. Competition for status in more merit, uh, meritocratic societies can sometimes produce much more, uh, much better outcomes than if everyone just rested on their laurels as equals. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much summarizing some of the stuff we were just mm. saying about the um, sort of specialization, division of labor, um, allowing people to you know focus on what they're good at and produce things that other people value, of which then you know society progresses, so so to speak. Um, yeah. I really liked the kind of environmental circumscription point. The idea yeah. that like now, like, you know, if we're staying put, then land means a lot now. Um, yeah. I mean, I was, I was thinking as well. So it was really interesting drawing a little parallel with the uh, principles of economics. 
because he was talking about like the origins of money and stuff. So before obviously money became like cold, hard metal coins and stuff, yeah. it used to be like grains because grains had like value because mm. it could feed you. Right. And I just thought it was a really interesting point here about when they first being able to produce excess, that's when inequality started. I was like, that mm. makes a lot of sense because usually you were just growing whatever you can to feed yourself, maybe on your tribe. And then there was no, there was no extra to be hoarded, to be given to somebody else or to have, unequal amounts this because everything would have been distributed right and i was just like that's so interesting because it's like if you think of that as the first form of like currency to like so to speak the grains because people would value it and they would trade for it yeah by hoarding it they're creating that first idea of we're rich you're poor almost in a way like we're rich because we're rich in grains which is the currency but or like a form of bartering currency back then right yeah um it's just really interesting and then it's just that mindset shift right when you start being able to think of producing more than you can just for your subsistence Mm -hmm. that's when the economy really proper like or capitalism so to speak technically would have probably started it's like this idea of like hoarding keeping some and reinvesting it somewhere else to get something else back you know yeah yeah. that's essentially what like some form of capitalism is isn't it right it's like saving capital investing it somewhere else to get something else back in the future and stuff yeah um yeah yeah interesting point so yeah, moving on to the more of the actual sort of elements of corruption, etc. So part three, moths to a flame. Um, <laughs> am I going to give the Duck Liz Adams quote? Yes, I am. It is a well-known fact that those people who want who mu- uh, sorry, it is a well-known fact that those people who most want to rule people are ipso facto those least suited to do it. Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should, on no account, be allowed to do the job. So Douglas Adams, the restaurant at the end of the universe. Um, <laughs> it's quite funny, isn't it? Yeah. So, survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is a subset of the statistical concept of selection bias. The idea is very simple. You need to study all possible cases, not just the cases that survived. Take this example. Did cavemen really live in caves? We have plenty of evidence that they did. After all, there are hundreds of cave paintings throughout the world. That seems pretty conclusive. But how would we know if there were actually more, uh, way more prehistoric Picassos living in grasslands and painting on trees? The trees and any art brushed into their bark are long gone. So it may be that the cavemen rarely ventured into caves to paint, but when they did, only that artwork was preserved. That's why survivorship bias is sometimes referred to as the caveman effect. And our understanding of the world is often badly skewed, not just by evidence we have, but the evidence we don't have. Yeah. And I love this is such a powerful idea across ev- like literally everything. Yeah. Um and I to the example that I usually have seen before, this is the first time I've ever been introduced to the caveman effect or whatever. The one that's always been used before is that classic example of did you see the plane which was shot in like World War One or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were asked the question of like where should we reinforce the plane um to make them like more safe, basically. And and they had um a picture of the plane that had been shot across all the different parts of it and was like let's just cover the places that have been shot and then he was like actually hang on a second this plane made it back home and therefore it's the places where it didn't get shot yeah. which is probably causing it to like malfunction yeah um i was like it's just mental because it is so true we always focus on the evidence we have and never what we don't have 100 um, percent. i mean think about all of us we don't have it right it's not, yeah. it's not possible to conceive of it because the evidence doesn't it's not there um which must make it really difficult, like, as a historian, when, like, you know, yeah. the only thing that you know is what has been preserved. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of stuff, like, you know, just gets, like, burnt down and, you know, raids and stuff like that. I mean, you know, yeah, it must, yeah. yeah it distorts it's, reality. It's why we can as, never as be as so sure of things, you know? No. It's like, uh, just knowing this one idea should make everybody be like, oh, hang on a second. Like, I, obviously, we can, we've got to trust the explanations we've created as a species. Yeah, yeah. But then there's also going to be a part of us that's like, hang on a second, what about the evidence that we don't see? Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's disappeared or whatnot, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a good point. And it's like, I think Nassim Taleb talks about it a little bit as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So applications of survivorship bias to power. These insights about survivorship bias are important to understanding who seeks power, who gets power, and who stays in power. It's not random. And if you only focus on the evidence in front of you, you'll badly misunderstand how the world actually works. Let's apply survivorship bias logic to the president or prime minister of your country. Why is that person in charge? To answer that question, three levels of survivorship bias need to be explored. First, who seeks power? 
Who wants to be the boss, the leader, or the coach? In answering that question, identifying the people who don't want to be in power is just as important as identifying those who do. Only those who try to gain power are the survivors. The rest are removed from consideration. Second, who gets power? Most positions of authority involve competition. It's not always a fair fight. Systems can be biased, and even if they aren't, some people are just better at climbing the ladder than others. The survivors in this round make it into power. Those who try but fail don't. And then there's the third level of surviving. Who stays in power? Plenty of people are a bit like Icarus. They <laughs> soar too high only to get burned and plummeted back to Earth. The leaders we focus on, good and bad, tend to be people who hang on to power for enough time to wield it with impact. We tend to focus on people who hit the trifecta. They seek power, they get power, and they hold on to power. Those who make it through all levels are survivors in survivorship bias. They're the individuals who consider to be powerful. Everyone else is comparatively invisible. Yeah, yeah it's such a good point, right? Like you just you think of stuff like Putin, who's everybody perceives as obviously the powerful right to some degree yeah, yeah. and he actually hits the apps like all three of those survivorship yeah, yeah. bias things then you think of people like liz trust who lasted what like a, like a week in power in england or some bullshit like yeah, that yeah, yeah. less than that do you know what i mean and they're forgotten by history within a couple of weeks i mean obviously yeah. they, they made a big mistake but like it's it's that type of thing um yeah but it I just like shows you that there's well. the three components you know to, yeah yeah to i consider. like this idea of the layers the layers of uh survivorship bias i think that's quite an actionable yeah. idea hey we can we can talk about that maybe at the end um, because I yeah. do, I like that it's you could probably dissect most most bits of evidence as well for certain theories or whatever through this idea of like what are the sieving the sieve for the survivorship bias here like what what layers does it have to go through yeah um, to be seen absolutely or not so yeah right the next part we got here so it's self selection bias so who pers who pursues power it's not random. Certain types of people crave it, and we try to seize it for, and try to seize it for themselves. That produces a form of self-selection bias. We recognize self-selection bias easily in other aspects of our lives. For example, tall kids are more likely to try out for the high school basketball team than short kids. That's why basketball teams are never a random representative sample of the population. The same is true for those who seek power. Certain traits cause some people to want power more than others. Too much attention is paid to the notion that power corrupts. Not enough attention is paid to why corruptible people seek power. Mm. So what happens when a position of power is unattractive? So what happens when a position of authority isn't particularly attractive? Without competition, self-selection is the only thing that matters. If only one person applies for a powerful job, then any power-hungry cretin can waltz right into authority. That's like rolling out the red carpet to the worst kinds of control freaks. And they do too often are the ones who precisely run our neighborhoods. And I thought that's a this is a really interesting point about this idea of like, let's say the job actually sucks. Like it's really not attractive. It's mm. not well paid, but it's a position of power. If you think about it, it does make sense for people to select themselves for that job. Yeah. If they're not interested in the money or whatever, they're not interested in the actual job itself. They're highly likely to be interested in the fact that a job offers them a gateway to, to power and control or whatnot. And I feel like this is kind of, yeah, that, the next point is the police. I was literally just about to say, think about like policemen, for example. But... Yeah. Um, yeah. So fixing police brutality, looking at the wrong problem. After the horrific murder of George Floyd in the spring of 2020, police reform has taken center stage in the United States and around the world. The problem is that most of the reform efforts are making the same kind of analytical error that the World War II generals were making before Abraham Wald set them straight. Departments are thinking too much about how to change the behaviour of police officers they already have, while thinking too little about the invisible, would-be, police officers they don't have. To fix policing, we need to focus less on those who are already in uniform, and more on those who've never considered putting one on. When you recruit into um, positions of power, it's not just about who gets the job and who doesn't, it's also about who applies in the first place. The reality is... A huge number of police officers have admirable motives for serving their community, but some don't. If you're a bully, a bigot, or a sexual predator, policing is a really attractive career choice, says Helen King, who served an, as an assistant commissioner of the Metropolitan Police in London. Um, do you want to do this bit? Yeah, I can give it. So who are the police? 
To get the right people in the uniform, the image of the police department matters enormously. When local police officers start seeing their job as military missions, they're going to hire more soldiers to complete, uh, to complete them. Nonetheless, so much of the debate around police reform in the United States is focused on changing police tactics, de-escalation training, body cameras, banning chokeholds, better oversight when force is deployed. All are worthwhile reforms, but they're all aimed at changing what the police do. Too little attention has been paid to a more fundamental cause, who the police are. What's likely to be more effective? Spending millions trying to retrain the small group of overly aggressive people who view themselves as soldiers and see policing as a war, or, attract, or attracting less aggressive people to the profession in the first place? Beyond the obvious issues that creates, the perception of racial bias in policing creates a vicious cycle. If people believe that the police abuse racial minorities, then people who want to abuse racial minorities will be more likely to sign up. That's one of the difficulties of police reform. To fix policing, you need better recruits, and to get better recruits, you need to fix policing. What the police do matters, but who the police are, who the police are may matter even more. And if you don't design recruitment policies properly, you end up attracting all the wrong moths to the flame of power. And yeah, yeah I think the policing is a, a very good example. Um, that I mean, obviously, a very topical example as well. But um, you can kind of see the point here, which is yeah, if you it's it's like that example of like when they say something like um somebody commits suicide and they put it in the news the amount of Loads suicides of people, yeah. goes up yeah it's like copycat almost like it kind of like it creates the association between the two right and then obviously people from this from this aspect here it's like oh i hear about the police like beating somebody up or i i fancy beating somebody up in my free time deep mm. down in the recess of my mind I'm going to sign up for the police, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of, like, it's not, it's not outspoken. People don't think this, I don't think logically. It's just kind of like, it's almost like a feeling they get. They're like, oh, wow, like, I, I'm a bit of, like, I like a bit of that. Like, I'm an aggressive individual. I like to sort of do that. Yeah. Um, or I would like to do that. And therefore, they're like, oh, please, that's for me. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. I think it is, like, definitely something to take into consideration because it does create this corruption kind of as well, man. self-fulfilling like, prophecy. Um, yeah because this relationship is suddenly made and it does require one side to almost take the first step to stop the mm. spiraling down. You know, in, I think in this book, he gave like an example of like the New Zealand task force and they like were releasing some kind of ads to recruit people. And it was like kind of a pun or like, it was quite kind of funny because it would be this guy and, and this like, these two police officers and they're chasing this person they're like oh, or they're chasing something they're like stop you know and then they see this old woman who's like struggling they stop to like help this old woman and then they continue on afterwards to go and get this you know uh, perpetrator and then when they get there it's like a cat or something that's like stolen like something and the whole point was <laughs> like you have to care about everything not just about beating someone up or like you know yeah. uh, using your your position of power um in your mm. own benefit and I think that is something that, like, yeah, needs to needs to have more emphasis on, like, who's being hired. Because you're, because you're right. I remember listening to, um, uh, was it Sam Harris? And he was talking about the statistics just after George Floyd about who gets pulled over and, like, who the media actually puts their attention on and who gets, um, uh, what becomes popularized. And they were talking mm. about, you know, there are way more, like, sh um, white people who are shot apparently because obviously they they account for a larger percentage um but it's nowhere near popularized or you know the media doesn't report it anywhere near to the same extent um as black shootings and so mm -hmm. then it distorts your perception of how the treat uh, how the police are treating different types of people and so mm -hmm. if you are a black person then you're going to be like well there's this unfair um approach to black people from police because now and I'm not saying there isn't, but I'm saying that now, like perception is distorted because it's not an accurate reflection of who actually gets pulled yeah, over. Yeah, but the attention is being guided guided towards it. Exactly. Yeah. And so then it that would change their yeah. behaviour, and that's what he was saying. Mm. Was like, you know, naturally you are going to be a bit on edge when you're pulled over because you think everyone who gets pulled over suddenly gets, you know, treated pretty mm. badly if they're if they fit into the same category as you. Uh, yeah i, I think yeah. it's also quite interesting as well I was, I was just thinking about it not even just from a police perspective but i wonder as well if if for example somebody gets a reputation for example the tories get a reputation for corruption if that if that increases the amount of people who want to be in the tory party if they want to be corrupt so you kind of go i mean how does government corruption like if there's an image of corruption that it, it interests the people who 
are for corruption or want to mm. be corrupt you know yeah it's kind of these things that the more it gets out the more people who are interested in that type of thing want to get in like uh so i wonder if like that that gets impacted too um, that's a good point but i don't think corruption is the end goal i think corruption is something that becomes part of the process i think it's more like i want power and i don't care okay. what i'm gonna do to get there right cool okay um, yeah, yeah it's a different type isn't it like uh, corruption is more like getting getting something out of it whereas power itself like in terms of like being able to physically dominate somebody through the police is slightly different than mm. the corruption i'm talking about here but yeah yeah no that's a good point um all right so on to part four the power delusion why our stone age brains cause us to give up power to all the wrong people there's a fundamental truth about human society. We're often more obsessed with how something or someone appears than with who they are or what they can do. Power is no different. If you look like a leader, it's easier to become a leader. That's why we often end up with a lot of cruel, incompetent people in positions of authority, such as Macron or Trudeau. Um, at first glance, that's a bit perplexing because power is relational. In other words, individuals can't be powerful alone. To become powerful, you need people to control. Power is therefore given, not taken. Or as primate expert Franz de Waal put it, you cannot be a leader if you have no followers. So it raises the obvious question, why do we let awful, incompetent, even murderous people control us? And why are, we so, uh, why are so many white guys in ties? The answer is partly because of the flawed evolution of our brains, dating back to prehistoric times. To see how this happened, we need to take a closer look at the signaling and status symbols. So yeah, signaling and status. <clears throat> the dimensions of signaling, honest versus dishonest, costly versus costless, costless, sorry, are useful for analyzing human behavior when it comes to power. We're constantly exhibiting honest and dishonest signals about whether we are dominant or powerful or weak and submissive. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it, but we are consciously aware of how to signal status. Big houses, Rolex watches, and designer clothes are all examples of deliberate and costly signaling to show excess wealth. This signaling is most effective when it's frivolous because it shows you're so rich that you're willing to effectively light money on fire for no practical benefit. Such ostentatious displays of wealth as a mechanism to attain status where deemed conspicuous consumption in the late 19th century by the economist Thomas uh, Thorstein Veblen, sorry, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, Bourdieu later argued that contrary to earlier belief, such displays are completely rational because they simply represent the conversion of money into social capital. For example, philanthropists often end up being perceived as leaders in society simply by waving around big checks for good causes. Um, yeah. yeah, but it, it makes sense. I mean, like, you know, money isn't the thing at the end of the day that people chase. It's what money can get you. And that's like power mm. and sex. Which is power. No, it's power. I guess you. then it comes to like, I can't believe he hasn't defined power yet. I can't, I can't remember if he does later in the book, but like for me, our form of the power is just being able to trans transfer or influence people's actions, mm. so to speak, or inf influence the world, I guess, in yeah. some way. Yeah. Um, and obviously money does buy you that because if you have lots and lots of money, you can influence people to do things yeah. that you wouldn't do yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah. Such as even wage wars, man, if you're that rich, like you get your mercenary yeah, force, yeah, yeah. you know, like it's, yeah. it's, yeah. No, it's true. And so, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I do like this kind of point that he's he's touching on of how, you know, there is a discrepancy in today's environment and our kind of prehistoric brains and how they work and how it's just our behaviors are manifesting in today's world. Um, so masculinity yeah. and leadership. Our Stone Age minds have created a mismatch with our diet and our fears. Then it seems, yeah with our diet and our fears, then it seems logical to wonder whether we also have a corresponding mismatch in selecting leaders. Are we hardwired to favor traits in leaders that our Stone Age ancestors would have found most desirable? It seems reasonable to wonder, for example, whether the traits that would have made someone good at fending off saber-toothed tigers or hunting gazelles are the same traits that make someone good at mid-level management of, or say, a paper supply company. Studies have shown, um, shown there's no male gender advantage in wielding power, yet society acts as if one certainly exists. Take a moment to reflect on how bizarre gender politics are when it comes to political leaders. With clock-like regularity, Vladimir Putin releases photos of himself shirtless on a horse, practicing judo or doing some other warrior show of strength. 
those signals can be affected because of our Stone Age brains still link because our Stone Age brains still link some perceptions of leadership to physical size. But it's absurd. Imagine if you were going in for surgery and your sur uh, surgeon spontaneously did 20 push-ups to show you his <laughs> physical prowess. You'd find another surgeon and probably call the medical licensing board. But when it comes to political leaders, modern societies often reward masculine shows of strength. Due to evolutionary mismatch, such signals are now utterly irrelevant. Yeah, yeah I thought that was a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's also so interesting how that Putin image has actually almost even pervaded my mind if I really think about it like honestly like I've seen him on that horseback you know yeah, the top yeah. bits, and you just you just think macho boy yeah. but I just think about this there is a perception maybe where like he only does that once and like the rest of the time he's just sat at his desk just being a computer nerd or some shit I'm not saying that's what he is well, what I he doubt does. that he goes riding you... topless all the time yeah. no no, no but what I mean is like I know I know that but it's more just like he pr obviously portrays through the media this like macho figure like doing judo yeah. whatever he says here but I wonder how little time he probably does any of these things. And it's just an image manufacturer. Yeah. And like, it's so interesting how, because I haven't even thought about it until we're obviously reading this book and now again, that I have those images locked in of him being like this macho man, even though he's probably 90% chance of not being at all. Like if you got him in the judo ring with somebody who's actually half decent, yeah. would throw him around the place, you know? Well, I mean, and it's just... he's quite short, he's quite timid, he doesn't, yeah, he's yeah. quite shy, he doesn't speak that much, but whenever he does, yeah. and it's the same thing with our our leaders as well. I mean, like, when they cut a big fucking ribbon for, like, you know, achieving some kind of goal, it's like, you know, we attribute this, like, oh, you know, they've, they've done something good, well done. But actually, I wonder whether a lot of it is, it's funny because, you know, he's obviously showing his, like, physical prowess, whereas... I wonder if politics is very difficult to understand for the average person or that we just don't have an understanding of it. And so because we're a bit detached, we resort to very basic signals of competency, um, which is like physical prowess, right? Because yes, I reckon I if would... you were in politics, then you wouldn't be as kind of convinced of those signals because there are other signals that you know. Well, you, well you know the person, but you also know the person half the time. Like you, yeah. you probably met the person a couple of times. So you get to like... It's just so different. Like it's like seeing a social media, like somebody's social media profile, and deciding you know them without actually meeting them. You know, yeah. like in person. Yeah, there is a massive difference, and I do wonder whether half the reason why, obviously, we learn through these images rather than through like deep dives, is because nobody has the bloody time to care. Half the, like the most of the population are so wrapped up in their day to day lives and their own problems. Yeah, that they don't really care too much about politics, and if they ever do see it, all they see is sound bites, images of Putin, whatever. Like all they see is these small snapshots of reality which obviously don't capture everything and then make their opinions you know yeah like like i'm even admitting that's exactly how i feel about putin and everything i have no idea who this person is inside and out outside of like the image portrayals you know but see that's... Never, i don't know yeah. anybody who's ever met him you know what i mean yeah i like you can gauge somebody much better through actually meeting them physically in person and spending some time with them you know yeah and it's one of these things that we with especially these political leaders we just make up i guess this is kind of where It'd be really interesting for them all to have like a mandatory fucking podcast where you had to listen to political leaders speak for hours on like specific topics so you get a real feel for them. Because, yeah. for example, I feel like I know Chris Williamson and Joe Rogan because I listen to a lot of their podcasts and other podcasts as well really well. I feel like, you know, if I met them at like a bar or something and had like a, like a pint, I feel like we're old friends almost because the amount of time I've spent listening to them and seeing their mannerisms yeah, yeah. and the way they speak about certain things, right? Whereas these guys who literally rule the country or rule countries and make decisions for the collective, I have no bloody clue what they're like. And I'm wondering if it's because they have more skeletons in the closet than anybody else. And it's kind of like a like a, a hiding mechanism almost because they need to portray this like perfect image. Whereas people like Rogan and, and all these other podcasters are kind of, even kind of what we're doing here, we're kind of willing to like put ourselves out there and people get to know us through just listening mm. to us, you know? Yeah. Um, And it's just funny that with all these other things, like the, the people who make the most important decisions, we don't know at all. Yeah. And the only thing we ever get informed of is through, like you said here, this image related stuff, which they know as well. They 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 know they're not stupid. These people they know exactly what they're doing when they do these stupid photos. Like you're saying, they're like cutting yeah. ribbons, shaking hands. Where they try and like you know they try and get their hand oh, behind yeah, the other yeah. person's hand, yeah, yeah. and they like like Trump like claps the other person's hand, like puts his arm around yeah, the back, yeah. like just just it's like. Yeah, you know, those many intricate like displays of power when they're like one to one. These motherfuckers, when they meet, they must be like, "Oh, this guy's just trying to trip me here. He's trying to like yeah, he's yeah. touching my back. God damn it! I know what he's doing here. Like it's." 
but mate it's, um, it's like when you see you know like house of cards or something like all of this stuff is just pr i mean mm. it's not like it's a reflection of them actually caring about half of the shit they do they have to mm. just rock up and show people that they pretend to care you know um it's like and i i think there's yeah you're right that you know the more you listen to someone the kind of less that less emotional distance to them you know kind of what we were you talking a bond, about even with their like negatives like even if somebody like you don't agree and you dislike part of them you kind of build up at least a perception of them that's more real and you're like oh i don't like this person because yeah. that reason but at least you know why yeah <laughs> whereas oh, don't well, know, you're not just, just you're just not conjuring up what you think about them instead you actually yeah. have something about them whether that's true or not but it's when like i was listening to um uh robert f kennedy jr and he mm. was on a podcast, like I've listened to a bunch of his podcasts on Joe Rogan and um, Jordan Peterson. And because of that, like they were talking about how crazy it is that you can listen to a potential presidential candidate for two and a half hours. Right. Like mm. that's insane. That's never it's never been the case before, because realistically, how often do first of all presidents have time to do all this stuff? But yeah. also it's crazy. But I mean, like you can listen to Trump talking to um, what's his name? Um, oh, the guy used to be on Fox. I can't remember his name. Uh, oh God, I know who you're about. Um, you oh my God, it's gonna, about. it's gonna. I Tucker, know exactly. Who Tucker, that's the one. Yeah, that's it. Um, awesome. yeah. But my point, yeah, exactly. I think there actually should almost be a uh, mandatory. Like mandatory they used to have these, like you know, debates and stuff. So people got like a feel for obviously mm. their policies they wanted to put mm. in, and obviously see how they deal with the combat. Yeah. But I just feel like just there's actually I I saw recently there's a guy on YouTube called Friendly Geordies. He is like. He's from Australia. He's got yep. a couple of million followers, I think. He does quite like he's he's a comedian basically, but he yep. does like um quite like politically relevant stuff. And he basically had the old Prime Minister of Australia on multiple times. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. And you just get to see this guy the way he thinks. And he was they were also dissecting like people had done like smart like hit documentaries on the old politician because he'd come back and it was like Sky News were like trying to slap like slant him. And they just they just both sit there and they just go through this documentary being like that's that guy's just lying right there and then yeah, yeah. and i quite enjoyed it because it's really casual and like the guy the, the prime minister is really quite funny and witty mm. and you're just like oh i like this guy i didn't know he was until i saw it and i obviously had no state really in australia but i was like i like this guy yeah and i don't know why more politicians don't do that because a lot of people go off like how do they feel about the person rather than their policies because at the end of the day the world is too complex and if you can trust somebody because you feel like they're a good person you're more willing, than willing to put them in power than somebody who just like looks the part yeah. and then just does jack shit no, um, absolutely. And I think there's also a, a lot of people don't care about politics, right? They right. don't really care that much. They're not going to put in the time. And so there's almost like, because obviously we have question time, which is the like mm. live debates with, you know, um, potential prime minister candidates, but it's all very politically driven. And obviously I'm not saying like that's incredibly important, but people also want to get gauge an aspect of their personality because it, it gives us an idea of like what they're like how their decision making mm. process is you know like their character a lot of the things that kind of go under the radar when we're recruiting people i think um yeah yeah it's just yeah it's just an interesting like it should it, it should be mandatory to be honest it's mm. like or like not in fact not mandatory but i feel like it's just a really effective campaigning mechanism these days if yeah. you go and do it and people end up liking what you say and like liking who you are you've got more chance of you know getting voted let's put it yeah. that way yeah yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, on to the next point. I'll finish this one, then you could do the next. Um, mm -hmm. Masculine leaders and threat uh, and threat study. A study found that when faces become more masculine, the more they are perceived as a good leader, and the effect is magnified when there is an increased security threat. Van Vucht, um calls this notion that we tend to pick modern leaders who share physical characteristics with men who would have made good warriors or hunters in the Stone Age the savannah hypothesis he explains evolution has burned into our brains a set of templates for selecting those who lead us and these templates are activated whenever we encounter a specific problem requiring coordination such as in times of war it's one of the reasons that authoritarian style strongmen the term is no accident gin up fear um, or provoke conflict uh, conflicts to consolidate power they're activating our hunter-gatherer instincts to turn to someone who seems strong when we are, um, when we perceive a threat. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. We've got these like kind of default rules, heuristics almost. So when no, we're... yeah, it makes sense. Like to reduce the complexity of reality, we just we go off like reliable signals from the past. Yeah, 
but like like with every single animal there's reliable signals they get hijacked you know it's um it's part and parcel of living i guess to some degree like once people realize oh this is a signal that people like use to make decisions there's mm. just try and corrupt this like this heuristic that people are using by pretending to be that of which they're using um but like, especially for example, like, oh, like if you know the circumstances what which lead to that which is a crisis mm. and this kind of what they talk about in the shock doctrine which will get around to uh, podcasting and summarizing on at some point but if you can invoke a state of psychological stress some kind of mm. crisis then you know that people are going to resort to some kind of archaic like you know template that no longer works um in today's in today's world right so then you can yeah, yeah. like you said hijack that ability um yeah to direct their kind of decision making in a way that you want rush decision making as well for sure mm yeah like but the best like uh, i don't know i i guess i feel like the best decision making is always made with time zero stress lots of time to yeah, think about all the it. variables right like it's no good decisions ever be made with like this is happening has to be decided by the end of today otherwise everybody's gonna die blah 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 but you know when you make a crisis and we make you know rash decisions so to speak you're always gonna maybe jump the gun miss miss important information variables or whatever but yeah yeah say la vie um okay friends enemies or strangers the biologist and author jared diamond in his book the world until yesterday argues that hunter gatherers classify everyone into three groups friends enemies or strangers friends are those dozen of families that make up your band who are from the bands you're on good terms with enemies are people you recognize but are from a rival band that lives in the same enemy uh sorry sorry same area the third camp strangers are rare but to be safe you must automatically assume they're potential enemies in the prehistoric past hunter gatherers would never meet someone who was from halfway across the world meaning that encounters with people from different races were effectively close to zero as a result racism could have been reinforced by psychological evolution over hundreds of thousands of years the same way that biases for height and gender were Today, many people still rely on these arcane, bigoted sorting mechanisms as a cognitive shortcut, even though it's completely irrational. In one experiment, researchers in Britain recruited football uh, soccer fans for a psychology experiment. Everyone who wasn't a Manchester United fan was screened out of the participant pool, but participants didn't know that's why they'd been selected. Then the participants had to complete two unrelated tasks. They were told that the second task would take place in a nearby building. The real experiment happened as participants moved from the first building to the second. Each person would encounter someone, an undercover member of the research team, who was visibly injured and needed assistance. In every instance, the encounter was the same, with just one randomised difference. A third of the time, the supposedly injured person was wearing a Man United jersey. A third of the time, the person was wearing the jersey from Liverpool, a rival team, and a third of the time, the injured person was wearing a neutral shirt. The participants stop to help those wearing Manchester United jerseys a whopping 92% of the time, compared to 35% for someone in a neutral shirt and just 30% for those wearing a rival team shirt. The rates of assistance tripled, basically, uh, sorry, based only on a logo. In-group and out-group affiliations need not to be defined by race. As the Manchester United study shows, we can identify with other human beings for all sorts of reasons, the Grand Falloon. While racism isn't going to be overcome with quick fixes or football jerseys, Forging broader forms of shared identity is one crucial first step of many to ensuring that leadership is populated with the best and brightest. And that was a long part, but very, very interesting and important. Yeah. I wanted to comment quickly on this um, thing about the racism heuristic kind of thing here, where it's talking about how we would never would have come into contact with somebody of a different race. I've genuinely always held the belief that I thought that was the reason why racism exists or has existed. I believe that there is some sort of psychological bias towards they look different to me because in the past it would not have been so multicultural maybe because of like the mm. ability to travel. Right. And I've always thought that was probably where it stemmed from. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just saying that's where it stemmed from. And then obviously we've, we've had this ability to like rewire our brain and change our stereotypes. Right. But I've always thought that is probably where it originated from. Right. Like in my head. Um, and then the second yeah. part, obviously about this like logo thing and being like, like we we always talk about this grand falloon now but this idea of creating a shared identity through a label a logo whatever it's just the importance of it like fuck like just even small little things you've been to like where you go to school like now having living abroad right in paris like 
whenever I hear somebody's from Bristol, I'm like, oh my God, from Bristol. Like, what the hell? Like, where, where I'm from? Like, it's so, yeah, I yeah, treat people yeah, so yeah. differently based on these, like, shared mini crucial steps or yeah. identities. And there can be many of them, right? Like, it's, it's nuts. Um, but it's so interesting, the massive psychological impact it has on people um, yeah. To, yeah, like, no, to, it, to help. It is, but I don't... <sighs> I've got an issue with this bit because I don't know whether it is racism. The way that I perceive okay. racism is I think that there is an intention there, right? Okay. The fact that you have some kind of unconscious heuristic of how you treat people, I don't think refers to, I don't think it should be referred as but, racism, right? Yeah. And I think in this, in this was, part, yeah. sorry, go on. Yeah. No, the only thing I was going to add to that is actually, I, I, I do agree. There's a difference between outright hatred hmm. And I and like attack on somebody for like for, for for race reasons. Yeah. In comparison to an evolutionary heuristical response, which is like maybe watch out or pay attention. Yes. So my yeah. my 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 response would be something like the heuristic I saw. Not saying oh my god, I'm designed to hate people of opposite races. Absolutely not. Is what yeah. I was trying to say. It's more like I would have been designed to be like oh hang on a second, are they a friend or a foe? Yes. The first question you would ask yourself. Precisely. Until obviously, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and, oh, just... and even off the back of the um, kind of football study, I mean, he literally mm. says that um, new, people wearing a neutral T-shirt is 35 and people wearing the, like, rival T-shirt is 30. That's almost, there's no difference there, right? So it's not like yeah, you're yeah. actively saying, I'm not going to do that to someone who's wearing a Liverpool shirt. You're just not clocking it. <laughs> Because your brain is yeah. obviously wired to clock certain things that realistically will benefit them. And in this case, it will be someone from the same member of the team, right? Like mm. someone who, who ha is part of the same tribe. Um, and so I, I, like, I'm not disputing any of what he's saying. I think we do have these like kind of prehistoric kind of biases, but I don't think it refers to like, I think it's more, um, maybe it's like a prejudice or just like how we prioritize certain people, but I just yeah, don't think it refers sure. to like. The I, I agree with the prior. I think prioritize is the perfect word for it. I think is, you know, if you see that shared logo of which you then almost have this like massive shared identity, and I think he's also picked, funny enough, one of the most tribal things possible, like a football team. Mm. Like let's be honest, like yeah. people feel so passionately about this stuff. Like yeah. it's it's completely different to certain other small things, but with like a with football is massively tribal, right? Yeah. Um. And basically, yeah, what it is is just a priority framework for like most people when they see somebody injured on the street, like fuck it, like even me, depending upon my mood, will be my my way I treat it. Depending yeah. upon the context, like where do I have to be? Am I in a rush? Do you know what I mean? That type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um. So I guess it's the same there, but the moment you see somebody who you can in instantly relate with, there is that pull. It's huge. There's this like pull. Yeah. There's like tribal pull of like, oh, this is somebody who needs my help. Like, fuck, if I was like walking in Paris, right, and I saw some guy wearing a French shirt injured on the street compared to somebody in an English shirt, like genuinely, like I feel bad even saying this, but I would know deep down <laughs> yeah, my instant no. response would straight away be like, I'm going to help this English person yeah. first. Like, it, it, and it sounds really bad, but that's literally how we're built. But I yeah. feel a pull to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like something we decide. It's something that in, inside of us, like I'm, I'm prioritizing this over this because there's a load of people here and the French person's going to get saved by all the French people here, but there's nobody going to look out for the English guy. So yeah. I'm going to go do it. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of that sort of mindset. But, yeah. Yeah, um, no, I agree. I don't know if this is where I'm missing that. I'm just like, <laughs> no, I just think it's yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. Um, mm. all right, so moving on to part five: petty tyrants and psychopaths. Abuses, uh, abusive su uh, supervisors are as common to workplaces as water coolers. They exist. <laughs> this guy's obviously had a bad experience, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he really has. Someone, someone broke his heart, and now, uh, yeah, yeah. They exist on a spectrum from the relatively harmless, overconfident, self-important blowhards to something much more sinister. Let's start by looking at the outliers, the psychopaths and narcissist schemers. They're rare. Odds are low that your boss or coach or the police officer who pulls you over is a bona fide psychopath. But because such people can be so destructive once in positions of authority, they warrant special consideration. Um, I'll go to this next bit and then. Yeah. The recipe for darkness, the dark triad. As its name suggests, the dark triad ha um, has three components, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy. Machiavellianism comes from the reductive caricature of a single idea from Italian political philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli, that the end justifies the means. Machiavellianism therefore refers to a personality trait marked by scheming, interpersonal manipulation, and moral indifference to others. 
Narcissism, named after Narciss Narcissus from Greek mythology, who is destroyed because he falls utterly in love with himself, refers to personality traits that often manifest as arrogance, self-absorption, grandiosity, and a need for recognition from others. And psychopathy, the darkest trait of the dark triad, often shows up as someone who lacks the ability to feel empathy and is impulsive, reckless, manipulative, and aggressive. Each of the three traits exists on a continuum. And just like a, a last bit, so there's also it's called the um uh oh what's what's four triad and what's four why am I why am I forgetting what like the word is for dark triad the dark square no it's not I can't remember what the fuck it's <laughs> called but anyway um uh, there's normally a enough... cube oh, I can't what the fuck is it that's really good I genuinely don't know the, what what you're on about it's so got I'm like a particular just... name I just can't remember but anyway Pentagon. <laughs> it's, it's, yes hexagon like um <laughs> no basically sometimes the sadism is also joined in there oh yeah, that's part of it is okay like deriving joy from inflicting pain on others um jesus but yeah sounds like somebody that wouldn't take it for a bit it's a fucking tetra ah, that's what it's fucking there called. you go <laughs> Woo. Get in there. i'm gonna mark that Woo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool so the biology of empathy. While neuroscience is still trying to understand the biology of empathy, it seems to operate through two systems, one bottom up and another top down. The top down system comes from something called a theory of mind or mentalizing. This is where we try to understand what other people are feeling and what their intentions might be. The bottom up system is believed to be associated with the mirror neuron system in which our brain activity mirrors the brain activity of someone we're witnessing. For example, Brain scans have shown that if you see someone making a disgusted face as though they just smelled something awful, the same part of your brains are activated as if you had just smelled something awful yourself. But not all of us are the same. Some of us react more than others to suffering. Using fMRI scan uh, machines, scientists can quantify the change in brain activity from our baseline to a reaction to seeing someone else in pain. Empathy is incredibly complex, but this method gives scientists a rough proxy to measure it. Um, and then, yes, so we've got the empathy of psychopaths. Valeria Gazzola and Christian Kieses, Kieses took that insight and measured empathy in psychopaths. In their study, 21 clinically diagnosed violent psychopaths were transported to their lab to be scanned. Oh, God. That's, 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 imagine fun, imagine driving that bus and what you've a way got to 21 like, psychopaths. Are, we have 21 clinically diagnosed violent psychopaths in your bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, now. Jesus. Yeah. A lot of labels, a lot of strong words, right? Yeah. So once inside the scanner, the psychopaths viewed someone getting hurt by another person. As the researchers expected, the neuron fireworks never went off in the way they do in the rest of us. The sections of the brain that are normally associated with emotion were dull and distant for psychopaths. The pain of others didn't bother them. But there was still a puzzle. Open any book about psycho psychopathy, uh, psychopathy, yeah, psychopathy, and the, and the phrase psychopathy, and the phrase superficial charm is probably on the first page. Psychopaths are smooth talkers. They're often incredibly likable, albeit in a glib way. They seem exciting to be around. A key to their success is manipulating others, but doing so requires making others let their guard down. How could people who didn't feel for others make us like them so effectively? To find out, Gazzola and Kieses decided to rescan the violent psychopaths. But this time, Professor Gazzola had an idea. She explicitly told them to try and feel for the other people to empathize with them while watching them suffer. In that experiment, the results were completely different. The psychopath showed neurological signs of empathy that mimic those of normal people. This led the scientists to conclude something surprising. Psychopaths can feel empathy towards others. It just doesn't happen naturally. Their regulation or their top-down and bottom-up processing is different from that of the rest of us. Um, yeah. super, that's a really interesting study, to you think? It is really interesting. It's such a clever study. Um, mm. That's when you're like, when you fall back in love with science, when you're like, oh, fuck, okay, mm. that's a proper study. That like, mm. yeah. Um, Hiring rewards the dark triad. Consider how we hire and promote people. Success relies on charm, charisma, and likability. Job interviews are performances. You may have gotten there with your CV, a good cover letter, and a strong recommendation, but once you're in the room, it's all about making the people there like you, while creating the perception that you're qualified for the job. The way we hire disproportionately rewards the dark triad. Confidence and competency. In a series of studies carried out by Professor Cameron Anderson and Sebastian Brion, they found that incompetent but overconfident um, individuals quickly obtained social status in experimental groups. 
even when competence was easily measured and plain for all to see, being overconfident made other people perceive you as more competent than you were. And this ties in perfectly with like psychopaths or more narcissists, actually. Um, actually, the whole three, because you can imagine that someone who's very charming, they're very good at coming across as being overconfident, even like overconfident mm. for their competence, um, competency. And, you know, when they, uh, they're willing to lie, I think that was another point of his in this, in this chapter, that they're, mm. we're willing to like stretch the truth a little bit, or most people are, but they're willing mm. to like fully make up something. And then they back it up by just being so confident about it. Be like, yeah, I did this course at Harvard. It was like great. And they've never even been to Harvard or never yeah. done it. Right. And, um, and because they're Machiavellian, right. Any, any means justify it at the end. So they're willing to lie. They're willing to do all these things. And realistically, mm. like, what's the repercussion? I mean, they either get the job or they don't. But mm. they probably got a higher chance of getting it just from getting in the room and talking to people. You know? Yeah, um, that's a really good point. And obviously, like they, he says there, it's, um, they get rewarded in that sort of job search the, uh, area because also a lot of jobs, like or sort of a lot of people who um submit applications for jobs the people who like review it don't tend to actually do too much due diligence they're not like they're all busy so they're not like oh calling up harvard to be like did this guy get there you can fraudulently make harvard certificates in this day and age with things like photoshop you know i mean you can you can create anything you bloody want so the the power is to them almost in a way like uh, especially in that aspect because you're right they just they can blag their way for anything almost as well so yeah yeah cool so that's covered the the personal aspects and now we're on to part six bad systems or bad people how can we tell whether someone abusing power is a bad person or just the or not just the product of a bad system this is a crucial question if you want to improve the world when those in authority act like abusive monsters we tend to interpret their behavior as solely the product of individual choice or personality defects sometimes as we've already seen that's dead on psychopaths and petty tyrants rarely deserve the benefit of doubt but sometimes when power is misused or abused, it's not because the person in charge is a bad person. And here we're encountering, once again, the fundamental attribution error, which I think has come about in so many different yeah. books. But it's one of the mental biases that I think we all probably um, use the most, let's just say. Yeah. So we as humans are horribly inept at deciphering the difference between awful people and awful systems. We frequently mistake unfortunate situations for malicious intent. That's because of the fundamental attribution error. Think about the last time someone took the last parking spot at the grocery store, bumped into you in the street, or cut you off while you're driving. What was your initial reaction to assume? That they're an irredeemable jerk? Or to reflect on whether it was just an accident, or they might be behaving that way because their mum just died? And it's just so it's mm. just so true, isn't it? Like the first instinctual response for us is always usually um this guy's a dick, this guy's done this, like, oh, he's what yeah. a, a bad person, rather than it's like, okay, what's the broader context this person's living in right at that moment? Yeah. Is this person pissed off in their day? Has something really bad just happened to him? Is he late? Like, do you know what I mean? Or is she late? Um, yeah. It's, and yeah, it's one of the hardest biases, I think, to overcome. It's, it's more just interesting to try, try and be aware and notice when you're doing it. You'll be like, oh, there it is again. Yeah. I'm, you know, jumping to conclusions or whatever, or jumping to character assassination yeah. before context consideration. Yeah, it's the difference between the kind of dispositional and situational blame, isn't it? As in, like, mm. we're very happy to blame our situation when we do something wrong and be like, oh, it was because of this or that happened or because of that, but never look inside and be like, actually, it was my fault. Whereas mm. when anyone else does something wrong, we're like, oh, it's them. It's their character. They're, mm. fuck- they're fucking shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but it's yeah it's such a well fundamental attribution error isn't it um all right so enforcement culture and belief of corruption i thought this was an interesting point we even behave differently depending on how we believe a system operates rather than how it actually operates chile a robust democracy in south america has similar similarly low levels of corruption to taiwan spain france and the united states yet as andre and as Lieberman of New York um, University notes, Chileans routinely find themselves amused as they read stories about foreigners, often Americans, who presume that everything south of the border is hopelessly corrupt. When stopped by police, some American tourists try to bribe the Chilean cops, which is a crime. <laughs> Back home in California or Connecticut, they'd never dream of bribing an officer. But in Chile, they're all too willing to give it a try. 
it backfires. Some end up in jail on charges of attempted bribery, all because of a false belief in how a system operates. Bad behavior clearly doesn't arise exclusively from bad character. Ineffective policing creates new tem uh, temptations. You'll probably get away with it, so why not try it? These insights matter enormously for understanding whether power makes people worse. If the system is to blame, then we should target our reforms at cleaning up the context. But if an individual who makes bad choices is to blame, we should target our reforms at putting better people in charge, or at least trying to make people uh, make bad people behave better. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, interesting. I was, gonna, I was just gonna add a little anecdote as well. I uh, I was hearing down the grapevine last night that in South Africa there is a lot of like bribery. Yeah. In terms of like with cops, like it's really easy to kind of like, get off stuff. Yeah. But I just thought it was so funny because I've now been told that. So imagine I go to South Africa and I get pulled over yeah. off that information that I've been fed. I might be like, oh look, I've just been pulled over. Here you go. Yeah. And they're just gonna be <laughs> just gonna be like, well, you're in prison now. Yeah. yeah. No. Exactly. <laughs> and these people obviously thought exactly the same. I don't know why they just. I guess they just generalized about the whole sort of South America and thought, you know, screw it everything's corrupt below the, yeah. the border and they've got themselves in way more trouble than they possibly could. But it's just interesting because it does guide behavior. 100%. Because I was even speaking to um, the person yesterday about South Africa and they were sort of even saying like, they don't care about getting caught by the police because they're just like, well, we can pay them off. Yeah. It's like, oh. and then obviously there's so much, such disregard for the system. And this is why it's so important to get it upheld, isn't it really? Because yeah. when you have that disregard, nobody cares. Like, yeah. oh, I'm just going to break the law because at the end of the day, I can just, you know, fine there's a, there's a there's a cost but there's not the you know it's not a big cost yeah. it's not a big enough cost yeah yeah um yeah no exactly so yeah and i think even like your experiences not even like your beliefs about something but your experiences can like shape it because i've i remember when i was in thailand i had to pay a bribe because i was like pulled over for not wearing a helmet when i was well, no, when okay, i was yeah. on my bike and meanwhile no one wears a helmet right but it's because i'm okay. the white guy he's like going past and yeah, it was kind no. of like look back at it, it's kind of funny. But they've like always taken advantage of you, kind of thing. Oh, like, yeah, oh, this guy's a tourist. Yeah. I remember like having this conversation with this cop, and I was literally pointing to all of these people on motorbikes going past without wearing helmets. But obviously, you know, he was having none of it. But you could imagine how, you know, I haven't been to Vietnam or Cambodia and whether their systems are completely different. But now my experience would kind of like, you know, shape my attitudes towards there maybe yeah, i could be yeah. like oh yeah you can just buy people there and then you go there and it's yeah. a completely different just, system right yeah um not that i'm planning on bribing anyone <laughs> in, Cambodia, in case anyone's wondering but uh yes um quite funny so to finish off this last bit then inheriting bad systems it's worth noting that a decent person um a decent person inheriting a bad system has to make choices that the person wouldn't make in a good system. Few of us inherit dictatorships, but many of us operate in broken systems. With constraints imposed by that context, we don't have absolute free will. Our behavior, good and bad, is shaped by those systems. Mm. Yeah. It's why you know, to be a lot of people sort of like argue for like system reform and stuff, isn't it? It's because like these systems are built in a different day and age and technology changes, people changes, you know, the systems get learned how to be what's the word like used they don't get corrupted themselves they just get learned how to like get through the loopholes right yeah you know? um so yeah cool so we're moving on to part seven i quite like this this part actually mm. this is really interesting with the dirty hands so part seven why it appears that power corrupts we often view power through warped eyes mistaking inescapable features of power with corruption caused by it power does corrupt but our overly cynical view of how much power corrupts is wrong. Some of that has to do with four phenomena, phenomena sorry, that are too often overlooked when we praise or condemn authority figures. Brian Klass uh, calls those four phenomena dirty hands, learning to be good at being bad, opportunity knocks, and under the microscope. Each gives us a, skew, a skewed perspective that causes us to believe that power corrupts people more than it actually does. This isn't to say that people in power behave virtuously, but rather to show that wildly held view the, sorry, the wildly held view that power makes people worse is often overblown due to cognitive mistakes when we make assessing those in charge. So I'll start with the dirty yeah. hands. So dirty hands. It is easy to get one's hands dirty in politics, and it is often right to do so, argues Mark Michael Waltzer, Professor Emeritus at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. He coined the phrase the dirty hands problem to refer to the unique set of moral dilemmas that politicians and others in positions of authority routinely face. In turn, 
the people we delegate authority to are sometimes thrust into situations in which all options are immoral. No matter what they do, it could have disastrous consequences. This is not to absolve, condone, or normalise grotesque acts of abuse and violence by those in power. Quite the contrary. Political leaders must be held accountable for any human rights abuses they authorise or enable. But it's worth remembering that sometimes people in power weigh up two awful options and try to take the lesser evil. For normal people, serious moral transgressions are avoidable. There's always another option, another path to avoid doing something repugnant. The overwhelming re majority of people don't knowingly make decisions that ruin lives or snuff them out. Instead, we deflect such decisions to others. We elect or appoint or hire people to make unbearable choices that we couldn't face. For most people in power, the dirty hands problem skews our eval evaluations of leaders by making them appear worse than they actually are. When we say power corrupts, we mean that power makes people worse than they previously were. Instead, much of the time, they just have to make worse decisions, which isn't the same. We should all be glad that Honest Abe was willing to play dirty to get rid of slavery, and that Churchill had the stomach to do what was necessary to defeat the Nazis. For those in power, immoral acts are at times clearly the most moral choice. And that's really interesting. It's I've said this to you so many point, times when I was like, they, they're just dealing with different problems. Yeah. People in power do not have the same problem you have, or they, they see the problem in a completely different way to you do. When you think, oh, this is the clear cut narrative, they're like, no, this is the narrative based upon what we have at our disposal in terms of like financial resources, you know, current data sets that are revealing what the problem actually is. And then they have to make a decision on the best course of action from that, you know? Yeah. And when we think we know the problem they're solving, we, we rarely do. Because if they told us that, then that would, it, uh, what you the word, like destroy their strategic advantage yeah. or whatever, or like, you know, it's not the it's sensitive information, let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Um, no, 100%. So yeah, I thought that's such an interesting point because it just makes sense. Like, how often do we ever get put into situations? It's a bit like the Israel Palestinian conflict at the moment, where, like, no matter what you do, like, how do you retaliate? There's no, like, rules yeah. to this. I mean, obviously, there's, like, rules of warfare to some degree. But there aren't not, like, really, are there either? Yeah, I mean, well, like, technically, there isn't deep down, yeah. If you just, like, yeah. Uh, of course. Obviously, there's, like, the Geneva Convention, but once again, you're talking yeah. about just life which can't be mapped to rules. I mean, there will always yeah, be course, yeah. gray area where you don't know mm -hmm. what to do, and there has to, the, the decision is between bad or worse decision mm -hmm. neither of them are good right and i think that's even a point that um hans rosling says in factfulness that sometimes there's just like there's no it could be getting it could be getting better it's just not the worst decision mm. um and it's kind of why i wanted to read that why leaders lie by um ah uh, yeah it's actually quite we should do that oh god yes we should do it we should. i've read it yeah we should do it um, we do it because it's quite a short one as well we can get that one done soon i would love to Discuss it John you. Mersheimer, I think that's his name. Yeah. Um, because yeah, yeah. once again, it's like, for some reason, we hold people in positions of power and authority to a level that we don't even hold ourselves to. That ourselves to, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Virtuous level. And then yet we're willing to like not be moral or virtuous in other areas of our life. But mm -hmm. for them, it's yeah. like, we presume that there's always an option that is like, the perfect option and is like pure but it's bullshit right there yeah, there yeah. isn't that they don't have the luxury of that and um like when he says here someone some would argue that's the cost their responsibility yeah some would argue yes but yeah. yeah yeah i guess so but it's it's finding the most moral the most virtuous but that doesn't yeah, okay. mean it is like perfect but this also right? once again the morality and stuff is always up to debate to some level yeah because because i yeah. think i don't remember the book now but there's always that difference between the intention and the result because you could take the most morally intentional bait, like the mate, like the best like intention ever, yeah. but get the worst bloody result. Yeah. Think about the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Yeah. It's the same. It's not. It's not the same. Or we made the moral decision to do this, which, which the idea was so grand, and everybody would be better off for it. Yeah. And then the result is everybody gets killed or something. Yeah. It's like, well, was that the morally correct thing to do? Probably not. Like, yeah. It's. It's not. It's this. I feel like there's also that continuum, like what's moral, what's not moral, and it's actually more like a continuum of like what is like lesser of the two evils like he's saying yes. here kind of thing and i think also um, how often do we come across a decision that really is so like morally dubious right as in like mm. you know it's when you make a new sale it's not like oh you know i skimmed a couple hundred pounds off is completely different to someone like you know making decisions in war where people's lives yeah. are, are lost right the, the discrepancy is huge we're dealing with completely different problems here um and yeah to hold the same kind of level of an like scrutiny is a bit kind of 
I guess once again, it's yeah. almost like unless you're put in exactly the same situation, same pressures, same problems to solve, unless you make a better decision, then how can you ever judge them? Yeah. Unless you, you have a better idea of the best decision to make in that. But then once again, you're never going to be privy to that decision they had to make. So you can never, ever evaluate the decisions in the way that you should. Yeah. If that makes sense. You can never, ever be like, if I was them, I would have done this. Yeah. Because you're never, ever privy to exactly what's going on in their like context. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's it's kind of funny because we abdicate our responsibility in a democracy to give power uh, two people to make decisions for us right but then as soon as they make one wrong we're like oh well, you shouldn't have <laughs> fucking done that right like but it's yeah it's it's like giving a gift and then telling someone how they should do yeah. it do it um yeah and it's also funny that you say that because it's almost like no matter what they do as he's saying here there's always like repercussions and there's always some people who benefit from repercussions some people who don't yeah. so no matter what you do you're sort of like you're cursed yeah. because there's always going to be somebody who you've inhibited to do something or other or of course some form of like negativity towards whether it's financial psychologically whatnot yeah um and therefore no matter what you do you're always gonna be scrutinized by some people yeah because it's impossible yeah. you can't make you can't make a decision when there's so much diverse impacts yeah um no 100 percent. yeah but anyway we got distracted now well that's such a good point in the dirty hands like, yeah it was one of my favorite things i took away from the book actually same same um so on to the next component that he was saying uh talking about so learning to be good at being bad learning is an integral part of getting power and holding on to it that creates a misperception if you analyze the data it would appear as if someone were getting worse over time that power was corrupting them in fact their bad intent may have been a static uh, may have been static while their effectiveness increased they were always corrupt they just got better at it in the early 2000s, the government of Ukraine developed an ingenious strategy. In areas that had a high density of opposition voters, election day seemed normal. People cast their ballots as usual, but when officials went to count them, all the ballots were blank. They weren't protest votes. Instead, the regime had replaced the pens in the opposition precincts with ones containing disappearing ink. After a few minutes, the X disappeared. Their rigging had gotten smarter. These are all instances of corruption, uh, um, malevolent governments getting better at becoming corrupt and malevolent. They got worse because their tactics improved, not because power corroded a previously <laughs> uh, upstanding moral character. And I think that's quite an interesting point as well. Right? Yeah, no, it really is. It's like, of course, it comes across, it comes across worse when the, the tactics and strategies got so sophisticated that the intention <laughs> looks even worse, right? Like, yes. It's like, wow i didn't even know they could bloody do that shit like, yeah. They... <laughs> um yeah it's not like they're... it makes a good point it's not like they're uh, working on autopilot instead they have to actively think how to get better at doing a bad job yeah like, yeah you know, like how can we corrupt. get how can we how can how we can do we it in a way that's like, less like yeah 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 less, <laughs> less likely to get us caught and be more effective together yeah like but it's it's funny it kind of just emphasizes that <clears throat> no matter kind of what path you're on You'll try and optimize it to stay on the path. And it mm. just ha so happens that this is a bad yeah, path, yeah. right? Um, I get. I know. I get what you're saying. It's like you're <clears throat> you're only solving the problem in front of you, yeah. And you've got like a kind of goal in mind, yeah. and you're just like taking steps to like, oh, how can we do what we're currently doing, but in a way that's like it's more efficient, that's like less likely to get us caught. Yeah. You know all these sort of things. That's, yeah. More yeah. More effective. Whatever. So yeah. Um, so now we're on to the third one, which is opportunity knocks. So let's now let's imagine an alternate world. In this imaginary world, human morality is governed by a precise statistical probability. Every time a person is presented with an opportunity to do something immoral or abusive, they'll behave badly precisely 10% of the time. Every 10 times that person come across a, wait, a wallet full of cash uh, on the sidewalk, they'll pocket the money once. Nine times out of 10, they'll return it to the owner intact. In such a world, who would be the least moral people? That question has two plausible answers. The first is that everyone is equally moral. They're all behaving badly and equal proportion of the time. Mystery solved, case closed. But the second answer, the way we normally seem to answer that, is that the least moral are those who behave immorally most often or who inflict the most harm on others. Yet, even though that logic seems badly warped, it's how we tend to assign blame in our world. Our intuition is to determine those who are bad people are by how, how, how often sorry, they do bad things. We make these judgments without any reference to how often an individual faced an easy opportunity to behave badly and hurt other people. 
That's a particularly relevant insight for people in power because being put in a position of authority necessarily produces more frequent and more consequential opportunities for wrongdoing. Being in a position to decide the fate of others gives you the opportunity to do harm. The same phenomena applies to everyone in positions of authority. So they face more situations in which they can hurt others. When they make the wrong call, more people suffer. Does that mean that power made them worse people? Or do they just appear to become worse because of that increase in opportunities and the magnification of consequences? Often it's the latter. And it's a good point here because yeah. you were pretty much just saying this, wasn't it? It was like, if they're just committing the same acts, if they're just making one bad decision compared to everybody else who makes one bad decision in their life, it's just the fact that theirs is magnified. And also, the, yeah, like if technically who's more moral in that situation in the world of like pure mathematical rigor of like one for one mistake? Yeah. It's it's just a different way of looking at it, and it just does make sense, doesn't it? Like, yeah. And obviously, having the opportunities, we've we've talked about this a lot before on the podcast. I can't, I can't remember; it wasn't this week for sure, but it was maybe on the art psychology of totalitarianism. We were talking about like just being opportunities to cheat, like like having a test of it. So, like, you could say I'm courageous. But how many times have you had the opportunity to display courageous behavior? Yeah. Right? Yeah, if that makes sense. Like, how often do we display the traits that we claim to have? Or have the opportunities to not display those traits, right? Yeah. So oh, I'm a generous person, but you've, the only other time you ever like had it is with like friends. Yeah. But being generous with friends isn't necessarily generous. I would say generosity extends beyond friends, but you can be generous in one respect and not the other. Yes. So No, a hundred percent, and it just shows you the level of com- complexity. We tend to look at it through this like kind of simplistic lens, but actually, mm. you know, a, a true tell of someone's character is what they do when they are presented with an opportunity. But then there's more complexity into that because it's like, well, how many opportunities are they presented with? Are they the mm. same kind yeah, of how many? How many exactly? Right. If they've done, if they've basically one out of a hundred yeah. decisions is wrong, when somebody else is doing twenty out of a hundred, is this person really more moral yeah, than exactly. the other person? Yeah, exactly. And and is there someone out there who is perfectly moral? No, right? of course not. They're everybody that's, has skeletons that's in their the closet. Thing. They all, everybody makes mistakes, right? Yeah. Because a lot of morality is also based upon subjectivity of like harm as well. Yeah. You could be like, oh, you've you've done something moral to me because you've hurt my feelings, yeah. for example, right? Like, yeah. you've harmed me, like, psychologically, but you would be like, oh, well, I didn't see why I would have harmed you. Yeah. Is that your fault or is it my fault? That type of thing. Yeah, like, yeah. We can get into that, but... No, exactly. Um, no, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, I, 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 loved, I loved this chapter. I thought it was just so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so on to the last point. So under the microscope, Let's again return to our mythical world of predict- uh, predictably corruptible people who behave badly with clock-like regularity, precisely 10% of the time. But now let's imagine that rather than picking up a lost wallet, these people are prone to embezzling from their employer. One woman works for a mid-sized paper company in, say, small town Pennsylvania. Another works for a mid-sized paper company in a grim commuting town outside London. Both have the same number of opportunities to embezzle. But there's one difference. In this fictional world, the anti-embezzlement watchdog, uh, watchdog group in Britain has 10 employees, and the anti-embezzlement watch, uh, watchdog group in America has just one employee due to a budget cuts. What um, would happen if we examine the embezzlement data? It would appear that the British embezzler was much, much worse than the American one because she'd be caught far more often, um, far more often even though they were behaving identically. When it comes to evaluating people who behave badly, the level of scrutiny they face is an essential variable in correctly evaluating someone's actions. This is particularly important for those in positions of immense power, because many operate under the constant gaze of a microscope. Sometimes the rich and powerful can use their considerable resources to divert that gaze, or to disguise abuses or crimes as legitimate activity. But much of the time, seemingly worse behavior by those in power can be chalked up to an explanation that we consider less often. They're simply more scrutinized than the rest of us. Millions of cases of small-scale fraud are likely left undiscovered because the perpetrators don't need to bother greasing the wheels to avoid detection. They just don't control enough money to warrant a second look. Often a colossal iceberg of bad behavior is under the surface. We often just see the tip of when people in power are exposed because someone bothers to look out for it. If that's true, then perhaps we're all worse than we appear. But the powerful get caught more because they're scrutinized more. Summary, our our intuitions about power can be flawed and mistaken. Four phenomena, dirty hands, learning um, learning opportunity and scrutiny make it seem that power makes people worse than they actually are. We sometimes confuse the effects of power 
with intrinsic aspects of holding it. Yeah. Yeah, this this well this we talked about this the other day, didn't we? Yeah. The microscope stuff, like the idea of being the more scrutinized you are, the more likely you are to like uncover stuff. Mm. I thought this is such an interesting point. I've always held this belief that um like this idea of mini scale fraud and stuff is left undiscovered because I've always thought about this like if it isn't worth somebody's money to or time to investigate, they're not going to bother, and therefore it's very likely that there's rampant fraud so much, mate. across very small like small businesses or whatever, even like medium sized to some degree, just because of the fact that there's like no reason. Like for example, let's just say you went into a business that only turns over like fifty k a year and they're doing rampant fraud, like and you just, it's just not worth your time. Like, if you, you what would you uncover? Yeah. You find them, they they go bankrupt. So it's almost yeah, like yeah. there's like an unspoken rule of it, which is also like let it happen, let like you know whatever yeah. kind of thing. Because it, it, it's that like age old thing of like surveillance fees, like letting people go. Because if you surveil everything and control everything, nobody will be able to have the energy and stuff to start yeah. and do stuff. So they just let it go. But at the same time, it needs to be like watched to some degree, right? I, I just thought it was quite interesting. I wonder whether AI will change that to a degree because now you yeah, don't need power yeah, money yeah. to to Yeah, I wonder if they can like look for idiosyncrasies in like accounts or look for yeah. idiosyncrasies within certain things and just be like, hang on a second, this doesn't make sense here or here or whatever and then I don't know. But I thought it was really interesting, especially this like it does make sense that like like small time crooks get away with shit because they're the spotlight's not on them, yeah. right? Like if, if any of the best crooks, are the ones that keep the spotlight away from yeah, them. Yeah. So I, I reckon the most, the most successful, like organized crime units avoid having the spotlight on the head yeah, on yeah. show, you know, because once the like, spotlight's on them, you're gone. Yeah. So it's just like, Oh, who are they? Whatever. And I wonder you know? if that's also like, can be said about corruption and people who are corrupt, because there's a difference mm. between, you know, psychopaths for example one of their traits is that they're reckless right they also mm. are very narcissistic and almost can't help showing off it's almost like an in internal thing that they like want recognition for cheating and that's why like you mm. almost, you sometimes hear about that with like serial killers is that they push their luck until they're caught because they have this like you know um compulsion so to speak uh to to show off and i wonder whether the most successful kind of corrupt people are people that don't go that far but still are corrupt and just try not to make anyone notice um yeah yeah for sure i feel like it's the ones in the shadows are the most the best are doing it mm -hmm. right because the whole idea of not being caught is means you're not in the spotlight yeah. <laughs> kind of thing yeah um but yeah so i think that concludes today doesn't it i think we'll carry on with the rest because we're running out of our time yeah um but yeah, so we've got, what have we got left? We've got the chapter of power corrupts. We've then got how power changes your body. Then we've got attracting the incorruptible, um, the weight of responsibility and watched. I believe that, no, and then also waiting for Cincinnatus. And I believe these chapters are more in like the lessons and takeaways we can take from everything we've discussed yes, today, yeah. which would be useful. We'll also finish that off with some, an actionable idea, I guess, off the back of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was, that's the first part of corruptible and we'll, probably record the next one in the next few days and get that one up yeah up soon yeah looking forward to it cool that's a wrap that's a wrap